Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, writers, scientists, educators, social scientists, government leaders. We speak to each one to one. I'm delighted to welcome the writer and editor Dominique Browning to the program today. The former editor-in-chief of House and Garden magazine, her latest book is called Slow Love, How I Lost My Job, Put On My Pajamas, and Found Happiness. It's just been published by Atlas and Company. Dominique was literally uprooted when House and Garden, the magazine she edited for 13 years, summarily folded. But she has shown us that there is a lot to savor after Condé Nast. So tell me about the title, Slow Love. You know, the title was the last thing I thought of. And um, it's not called Slow Life, which is where I was going with it at first. But I started to get very busy, even as I was writing the book, with assignments and writing and things like that. And I started realizing that it wasn't about slow life. It was about falling in love with those moments around you that are around you all the time that are about the miraculous, just everyday life moments. And I realized that we need to kind of build those into our lives. You know, we need to put in speed bumps and stop and enjoy what we have. It's about falling in love with the world. Mm -hmm. So let's go back a little bit mm -hmm. before you found slow love. Yeah. Uh, to, about your life at Condé Nast and there are all these myths about it. What was it like? And they're all true. All ah. those myths are true <laughs> and beyond. <laughs> what was it like being, being at Condé Nast? You know, it was a very fast-paced life. I always was busy. There is a, the editor-in-chief of a magazine at Condé Nast is not only worrying about what's going in the magazine, but is also involved with marketing, with ad sales, with all kinds of things. So it's a new world from mm -hmm. the magazine world I went into when I started. It's a very, very busy time, and um, there are so few of these positions that there's also a lot of politicking going on within the company. So you're watching forward, you're watching your back, you're watching all around you, and you're trying to create a bubble around your own team so that everybody stays focused on doing the best possible wor work. So it was a very busy life. Mm -hmm. Now, my producer said she um, read about an editor, not you, uh, who was shocked to realize when she left the building and it was raining that she was getting wet because for years someone had always held an umbrella for her as she went off to her waiting car. Is this a myth or is it almost true? I'm sure it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing surprises me anymore. So describe the day you were told you were being let go after 13 years, that the place was... I Folding. went into um, the corporate office for a meeting that was supposed to be a circulation meeting, which is a meeting I was looking forward to because we had a terrific circulation. We were up to nearly a million readers and we had renewal rates as high as the New Yorkers. That was mm -hmm. really running along smoothly. And I was stopped in the hallway by the editorial director, who's somebody I've known literally for you know 25 years in the business. And um, he said, come into my office, I have to tell you something. And my heart just stopped because I thought, uh-oh, something's wrong. And that's when he said, we're going to fold the magazine. And the reason for folding was? We had lost another publisher. Um, our publisher had left. And in 10 years, we had five publishers. Okay. Six publishers, actually. Um, and that's a lot of turmoil on the business side, over which I had no control. But it meant that marketing plans, advertising sales, everything was constantly being disrupted. So it was like hard to get the plane to take off mm -hmm. in a smooth way. And I think when the last publisher quit, I think they finally decided we don't want to do this anymore. The economy was beginning to tank. Mm -hmm. Housing is always an early indicator, and um, you know the furnishings market, home, the, the stuff people spend on their homes right. starts to shrink, and that's a lot of the ad base for magazines like this. And they had started several other magazines in the same category because I think because we were doing so well, they thought, well, we'll just spread it around. Um, so we had Domino, and we had Vogue Living, and we had other magazines coming on, and I think it was just too much yeah. weight. How many people lost their jobs at that time? Oh, at least a hundred, um, wow. probably more. Wow. Uh, shell shocked. Flattened. Shell shocked doesn't even begin to describe it. Yeah, I was. I, I was literally immobilized. You know, the first few days while we were packing everything up, 
Um, I was making calls to everybody I knew to try to get people jobs. You know, when you have people who work for you, you worry about their mortgages, their school right, tuitions, right. you know, how they're doing. And I really wanted to make sure everybody got settled as quickly as they could. So that that was a very busy time, and it didn't really sink in until I got home with my boxes, and I had my first day of not having an office to go to. First day since high school of not having a mm -hmm. job to go to. Now, I remember when the day that New York Newsday folded, and they came, get us together and told us, and one of the women, a reporter, uh, was, was starting to get worked up, and she was asking the publisher, so at the meeting, well, when people call us, you know, who do we tell them we are? If, if I'm no longer a reporter for Newsday, you know, who am I? It's and of course, true. that's not a, of course, that's not a question that he could answer for her. Right. But you know, this this idea of the loss of identity right. and the loss of power that you had, right. you know, whether as a reporter or as an editor, right. was really difficult yeah. to deal with. Yeah. Um, so after you've been at the top of your game, uh, did you did you go out and start looking for work immediately? Oh, immediately. And what happened? You know, I called everybody I knew. I got phone calls from colleagues in the industry. I did some consulting work. I worked for the Wall Street Journal for a few months, working mm -hmm. on their Saturday edition. Right. I did some work for New York Magazine. I started getting writing assignments. Um, I did as much as I could, and unfortunately, it was at the same time that the whole publishing industry started to just come apart right. at the seams, and people were being laid off all over the place, so certainly nobody was going to be hired. So you're at the top of your game, and then you find you're unemployable, at least for a full-time job. Yeah, that's right. Um, and you experienced, you know, a, a kind of tsunami the year you were fired. You parted with your longtime lover, and... You're out of your job. Tell us about the relationship with the man you call Stroller. Well, you know, I, I think a lot of us have had a stroller in our lives, a, a relationship with somebody that you adore, but who's quite ambivalent about commitment. And um, Stroller was a legally separated, but remained married person um, who wasn't living at home um, and was paying child support and alimony and all the rest of it. So he's a totally legitimate relationship, but he couldn't quite make the commitment to a new relationship um, with me. And, you know, it was it, it was a tsunami. You're absolutely right. It was like I hit 50 and everything went haywire. That relationship, I realized, was not making me happy. I had a cancer, kidney cancer, that hit me. Um, my children were growing up and leaving home, and I had to sell my house. So it, everything was dislocated, but while I was working, I could kind of ignore all of it. I could just stay right. very busy and right. close the door on it. And it was when things got very, very quiet that I began to look around at the rest of my life and think, okay, where am I? You know, is this how I want to keep going? So, and, and the question is, how long, how long were you in the relationship with Stroller? Oh, almost 10 years. How, and the question is why a talented, dynamic, self-sufficient, financially well-off woman like yourself stayed in a relationship with someone who was commitment phobic for so long? Well, because, you know, in a way, I didn't need to really think about it. I mean, he was a wonderful, he is a wonderful person, so I don't want to denigrate that. Mm -hmm. And um, he's a wonderful person, and I wasn't thinking about remarrying or getting involved deeper. Um, and it was only as time went on, and I realized that he was stuck in some way, that it began to dawn on me, this is not getting better. Right. How did he react to your book? Well, he said it was my best book, and he's read all of them. Um, and he um, talked to me about parts where he felt I wasn't quite fair, and so I adjusted because I wanted him to read the manuscript. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to spring it on him. And, you know, he said it was weird to read about himself, but on the other hand, he's a very big, larger-than-life character himself, so I think he probably liked reading about himself mm -hmm. a little bit. Is he too. still married? Oh, yeah, still the same. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, still married, still in his own apartment, right, still legally separated, right, still right, paying alimony. Right. <laughs> now, now um, your, your children are also mostly out of the house by this time. Yeah. Um, so you start going through phases that you document in the book, and one was muffin maker and cook. 
Tell me about the... You know, I went for the comfort thing, and um, I just started eating I, sugar. You know, you get that... Right. You feel like you can't do anything, and that sugar gives you a little rush of energy. And so I started buying cookies, and I thought, well, I'll start baking. So I started making muffins, and I ate, and I baked, and I ate, and I baked. And it was wonderful, in a way. I think I was trying to learn how to take care of myself, mm -hmm. and, and I was having a good time with it, too. I was going online and finding recipes right, and right. finding all these bloggers who blog about food, and that was pretty great. Insomnia, yeah. something that I deal with. Right. <laughs> um, how did that affect you, and what did you, how did, what did you do about that? You know, that, that just hit me. That just knocked me sideways. I mean, first, I went through a period where I couldn't get out of bed. I was just sleeping all the time. And then suddenly, maybe because of all the sugar, I never thought of that, um, I was awake half the night. Mm -hmm. And I, um, you know, I, I fought it. I struggled with it. I did all the things you're supposed to do. I didn't turn on the lights. I did turn on the lights. I got out of bed. I didn't get out of bed. I, you know, I did everything I could. I took hot baths. Um, and then one morning, four o'clock in the morning, I thought, you know, uh, enough. And I went over to my piano, and I used to play piano a lot, and I hadn't played in a long time. And I pulled a piece of Bach down off the shelf that I had not ever played, um, and I started playing it. And it was a moment of light coming on, because I think I fell into somebody else's rhythm, into somebody else's notes, into somebody else's music. And it calmed me. It didn't mm -hmm. put me back to sleep, but it calmed me. Mm -hmm. Maybe I better start playing my piano Maybe again. You oh, well, do you play piano? <laughs> I, I used to play really, really well, but I hadn't played for okay, years. Well, there you go. Oh. That's the secret. <laughs> uh, and gardener. That big gardening, yeah. that came into your life. Yeah, gardening came into my life. I sold my house, the house in which I'd raised my children. and um, Which was... In just Pelham, as, okay. just north of the Bronx. Um, it was a very easy commute into the city, and it was a great place to raise the children. And I moved up to Rhode Island, and that had been, uh, you know, there was no garden there, so I started putting in a new garden. But that had been your country house. That had been my okay. country house. And, um, you know, I, what I realized later is that moving, physically moving, is one of the keys to getting out of feeling flattened. So whether you take walks or you do yoga or you jog or you garden or you play piano, but doing something physical mm -hmm. has a really great effect on the mind. It just knocks things loose and it gets you flowing again. And, and I think that, in the end, is what got me going again. Okay. We're going to take a short break. Then I'll be back with more with Dominique Browning, author of Slow Love, How I Lost My Job, Put On My Pajamas, and Found Happiness. El Estatuto de la Ciudad de Nueva York es la constitución de los cinco condados. La Comisión de Revisiones del Estatuto está revisando nuestro libro de reglas gubernamentales. Contribuye al futuro de nuestra ciudad. Para saber cómo, visite nyc.gov diagonal charter o llame al 311. The City Charter is the constitution of the five boroughs. Now the Charter Revision Commission is reviewing our government rulebook. Help decide the future of your city. To learn how, visit, visit nyc.gov slash charter or call 311. Ville New York la don constitution, li re le City Charter. Kounia di le pou nou revize l. Zoto Brea mande nou pou nou ede yo fè sa. Pou plis informasyon, li le 311. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. I'm talking with Dominique Browning, author of Slow Love, How I Lost My Job, Put On My Pajamas, and Found Happiness. It's just been published by Atlas and Company. Talk to me about your bout with kidney cancer. You know, and what that was like. That was one of the most frightening things I've ever been through, and I was one of the luckiest people in the world because it was found completely by accident. I'm like a poster child for early screening. Um, I was getting a scan for something else, and the doctor happened to notice a mass on my kidney, and I was basically sent to the hospital immediately. Um, Anyway, the kidney was removed. Kidney cancer is known as the silent killer. 
because there's no chemotherapy and there are no symptoms until usually it's too late and it has spread to other organs. So luckily mine was encapsulated in the kidney. They don't even do a biopsy, mm -hmm. it's so dangerous. They just take the whole thing out. Okay, um, so they remove one, one of your kidneys. They removed one of my kidneys. Okay, did you do chemotherapy? Did you have there to do any of that? There is no chemotherapy, okay. there's nothing. You know, it's a pretty scary thing. Mm -hmm. And what did I do? Like I'm in the hospital in my bed taking phone calls from the office saying, yes, I'll try to be at that meeting. Just as fast as I can. Wow, you know? wow. Um, so the decision to sell your house and to move to Rhode Island, why, what, what, what triggered that decision? You know, I decided that I didn't need a house that was big enough for two children and the whole trappings. Um, and I felt like I wanted to get away from New York um, and away from my old life as a commuter. And that house, the taxes were high, had a mortgage on it, and I wanted to be out of debt. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I say this to all young women who I interviewed for jobs when I was hiring people save money, be careful with your finances, right. you have to take care of yourself. And I have taken care of myself since high school. So I really felt like I needed to get out from under that burden and, um, and become a little more liquid. Mm -hmm. It sounds like packing up was more difficult than deciding to move. It was more difficult, actually. Yeah, you know, you accumulate all these things, your children's paintings, art, books, tons and tons of books. You have to decide what to get rid of and yeah. what you're gonna keep. You were fortunate in, in, in that you were careful with your finances so that you've been able to, main, to, some, to maintain, a, not the lifestyle you had before, but to maintain a decent lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And you're certainly a lot better off than you know, a lot of people who have been let go in recent days who still really need to work full time for another 15 years or so and who don't have a second house in the, in the country to move yeah. to. Well. No, I know. And, you know, my heart really goes out to people who are absolutely financially lost in these days. It's a really, really terrible thing to have to go through. I have to work and I'm working incredibly hard. I have to keep supporting myself. And, you know, I have to worry about health insurance and all the other things mm -hmm. that we all worry about. Um, but, you know, I do consider that I was smart to save money, that right. I was smart not to live beyond my means, which is something that is seductive when you get into that right. kind of world. Tell me about your life now. My life now is very busy, very productive. Um, I'm writing a regular column for the Environmental Defense Fund, and I am passionate about environmental issues, so I feel like I'm doing something that I really believe in. And I'm freelancing. But my life is totally different in the sense that I run my own schedule. You know, as a writer, you, um, I, I mean, I have, my motto is never say no. I write for everybody, but I manage my deadlines. I write when I want to write. I garden when I want to garden. And um, so my time is much more flexible. And you've embraced your insomnia, I gather. No, you know, that my sleep patterns have gone back to normal. Oh, really? Yeah. But I've also started a new blog. I've started blogging at slowlovelife.com. And so now, if I'm up in the middle of the night, I just write a blog post. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, your relationship with children, where are they? And what's your relationship you with know, them now? You know, that was another interesting thing about um, hitting this age, is that I realized I had to learn how to become a mom to adult children. You know, that you can't keep treating them the way you treated them when they were little children. And my younger son was especially pretty upset about my losing my job because, you know, he said to me, Mom, you worked your whole life, you gave it everything you had, and then look what happens. They just get rid of you and they don't care. So what's the point of working so hard? And it took me a long time before I could say to him, you know, the point is not the undoing. The point was in the doing. Mm -hmm. I loved my work. Right. So it became a real life lesson, but I hadn't really thought how affected they would be. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it is something, I mean, it's rather shocking and having seen, you know, people at Newsday in various phases who got laid off or took a buyout uh, and you f have felt, if you've been there for a long time, that, that you were valued and then suddenly when you are on the layoff list or the buyout list, I have a friend who went to a, uh, I guess this is a farewell party for the people who were leaving in his group mm -hmm. and he said, you know, it, it was like, uh, 
they hardly saw, I mean, he felt really badly because it was just like, oh, you're leaving, bye, you know. Right. And I think he started crying, he said, uh, because once you're no longer going to be with them, it's sort of like, you know, your history. Right. And you feel just sort of, it's, it's, it's rather devastating. Yeah, that's true. You know, the water closes over. Right. And it's like you were never there. Right, right. Uh, what's your relationship with Stroller now? He's a friend. I see him uh -huh. from time to time. And dating, have that's an area that you have gotten into? Um, no. You know, I was dating for a while after all of this happened, and then I just thought, you know, I'm just, I'm in no condition to do this. I'm sick of it. I, it feels like a job interview. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just gave up. I walked away. Mm -hmm. um, no, and in fact, actually, one of, one of the... Um, one of the important things I learned here was to embrace my solitude, you know, was to really sit with that silence and to sit with being alone and to think about why was I so afraid to be alone? And that was also a part of going through this journey towards mm -hmm. feeling more peaceful. Right, right. Uh, and, I, and I've heard other people um, um, write about that. I, one of my favorite uh, writers is Nula O'Fallon, mm -hmm. the uh, the Irish writer, mm -hmm. and she, mm -hmm. I guess she was in her fifties, and she had, ended, she'd had many relationships with men. She'd had a long, sustaining relationship with a woman, and she found herself alone, you know, and I guess in her fifties, and it's Christmas, and she talks about this. In the last scene is about you know going on a walk with her dog, yeah. and on this Christmas day, and how wonderful it was, and how lucky she was, and how lucky the dog was, and so this idea of, you know, coming to terms with solitude, exactly, and not necessarily being depressed by it, and also yeah. finding the kind of strength that you can find in solitude, mm -hmm. and the regrouping and the deeper understanding of what it is you are looking for in a relationship instead of just being buffeted around by whatever happens. Right. Um, do you ever, are you ever afraid of, uh, in terms of the writing of, of, of assignments not coming? Sure, I up? worry about that, you know, because I think the magazine industry is changing so rap rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, blogging has been an incredible eye-opener for me. I resisted doing it, and I'm glad I didn't do it while I was a kind uh -huh. uh, You know, now I can do it exactly the way I want to do it. And it's been an eye-opener to see what that world is all about. And I'm very excited about what's going on online and um, what the possibilities are. So... I'm happy to have entered into that world, and um, and I think things might happen there that we don't even really? anticipate. I mean, you know, I mean, one of the issues is because every everybody's everybody's blogging now. But I mean, one of the issues is um, that most bloggers are not paid. Right. And how how are people going to, going to make a living? Right. How are journalists? people who've been journalists, how are they going to continue to make a living? Well, you know, we're doing the same thing in our own little ways that places like the New York Times are doing in their big way. They're giving away content, and mm -hmm. they will figure it out. It will be figured out, I'm sure about it. I know it'll be different for different kinds of organizations. Right. And I feel like now that's what I'm doing by blogging and what bloggers are doing. We are providing content, and we're drawing an audience. And eventually, the economics of that will be figured out. What made you decide to write the book? You know, I didn't even decide to write it. I started writing after I started gardening, and I write my way through my troubles, and it's a way for me to understand what's going on, and it slowly took shape as a book. And in the end, what I felt best about was being able to put into words the kind of pain and confusion that a lot of us are feeling, whether it's because of a job or a divorce, a heartbreak. Um, but to be able to put that into words and then to be able to say to people, you know, there is a way out, there's light at the end of the tunnel, and, and then um, this experience of just falling in love with these mundane things of right. everyday life was just transforming to me. And, you know, I've tried to hold on to that as I move forward. What do you see for yourself going forward? More writing and more adventures. Mm hmm Sounds exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I hope. <laughs> I hope it's fun. <laughs> well, I enjoyed your book, and I, I hope lots of people are gonna, going to read it and uh, fall in slow love. Great. We're out of time. My thanks to Dominic Browning for us. Slow Love, How I Lost My Job, Put On My Pajamas, and Found Happiness has been published by Atlas and Company. For the City University of New York and One to One, 
I'm Cheryl McCarthy. If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.